God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good. you this morning to Benton First Church of the Nazarene, and I am absolutely thrilled that you have joined us together, joined together with us this morning for worship. As we begin worship this morning, let me just make a couple of quick notes right now. First of all, I've had a lot of you ask me in different ways how they are going to be able to continue in their giving of tithes and offerings. Let me tell you, you want to talk about a question that thrills the heart of a pastor, that's it right there. I want you to know you can continue giving by simply mailing your gifts to the church address, which is at 1203 West Severe in Benton, Arkansas, 72015. Also, we, are set, we have set up online giving for those who would like to employ that option. It is through the Tithely app online or on your phone. You'll find reference to it in Benton, uh, the face group, Facebook group, uh, Benton First Church of the Na Benton First Nazarene Friends, and I will also send an email out shortly with all the pertinent links and information contained therein. Furthermore, on the, in the comment section of this video, I will also take and put those links there for those who are interested in trying that. Secondly, this morning, I want to make sure you understand that as we enter into worship, please remember that worship is not a spectator sport. You're not here to watch us. You're not here just to see how we do things here this morning. We are here to worship the Lord. Worship is community, where God's people come together to lift on high the name of Jesus. But worship is also interactive. As we lift our voices together unto the Lord, God himself descends and he inhabits the praise of his people. So wherever you're at, put aside every distraction. Take and put aside those things that have your attention right now other than worship. And as we begin to sing, as we pray, join with us in prayer. Join with us in song. Join with us in everything here this morning. And experience the community nature of worship here today. God is with us. He's not left us. Worship Him where you are. Exactly where you are and what you're doing right this moment. Guys, it's a whole new world. It really truly is. It doesn't mean that this will be always and forever like it is, but it has shown us that things are not what we thought they would always be. It is a whole new world, but it can also be the dawning of a brand new day. God has spoken hunger into our hearts. God has, has given us a thirstiness here this morning for God 
for the presence of God, for the presence of God's people, for the church being the church. And it is a gift. It is a gift. So this morning, in spite of all that's going on, let me remind you that God is on his throne. Can I say that one more time? Yahweh, our God Jehovah, is still on his throne, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we worship him. The psalmist himself declares that God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. God reigns over all the nations. And God is seated on His holy throne. Therefore, we will worship Him. For He is worthy of all glory, honor, power, and praise.
thank you guys so very much. It's been good to worship with the worship with you guys and to worship the Lord here this morning, even in difficult times. Our text this morning is from John, the fourth chapter, verses five through twenty-four, and, and hold it open. Really, I'm going to touch on it here in just a few moments, but I would encourage you this morning as as we take and we move through this time to take and read the scripture. Uh, later on, if you want to revisit this video, you can just take and read the scripture ahead of time. Be, soak yourself in it. Let it permeate your being. And then hear the message again that God has to speak. God is speaking through his word. God is speaking through his people, even in these times. And God speaks in some funny ways sometimes. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to visit one of our sons and go out of town and visit one of our sons uh, for just a little while. And while we were there, we were visiting with his wife's family. And like everybody else at that time, we, we entered into that conversation about what's going on in our world right now. Everybody's talking about it. You walk into Kroger, you talk about it. You walk into Walmart, you meet strangers, and you talk about it. It is the topic of conversation right now. So we began to talk about and discuss the current state of our nation, our state, and, our, and of everything during this coronavirus epidemic. In the midst of that conversation, his mother-in-law, Wendy, said that the other day while they were speaking, she was speaking to her child, children, one of her children stopped and looked at her like a kid will. And, she, and he asked, he said, Mom, what did we do, what did you do last time this happened? Wendy said she stopped and her mouth kind of dropped open. And she looked at her child and she simply said, this, is, this has never happened before. This is the first for all of us. It's never happened, at least not in the realm of our lives or our experience. It, it has never happened. It's brand new for us. It's the dawning of a new day. And I believe that God is in the midst of it here this morning. That's not saying I believe that God caused it. I cannot ascribe evil to God. And I will not ascribe evil to a holy and loving God. But in the midst of it all, God is faithful. God is good. And remember, God never wastes a hurt. He'll never waste a hurt. He'll never waste a difficulty. And he will form you and fashion you during these times. So just let him do it. Say, Lord, here I am. I am the Lord's servant. Be it to me as you have said. God's creating a hunger in us. Aren't you hungry for him this morning? God has answered our prayers. We've, we've been asking over the last months and years, Lord, give us, Lord, a great hunger and a great thirst. I didn't think that he would do it this way, but he has done it. And I see a hunger and a thirst for God within the church, but also outside the church as I'm interacting with different folks. It's a time, I believe, of great shaking. It's also a great time, it's a, a time, I believe, I'm absolutely convinced of it here this morning, a time of great awakening. Francis Francia Payne, in his book, the, in his book that is entitled, This Day We Fight, Breaking the Bondage of a Passive Spirit. He says these words. He says, if we succeed in these difficult days, it will be in part because we have renounced the seductive limitations that, ac that accompany a peacetime mentality. Indeed, we must embrace an aspect of spirituality that is unfamiliar to many Christians, one that is both militant and vigilant toward evil, yet is compelled by the purity and fire of Christ's love. The Holy Spirit has been calling the church to arise to intercessory prayer and to exercise spiritual authority. And with holy urgency in my heart, I say that we do not have to languish in self-pity about life's injustices and inequities. In a time of war, we must not be distracted by inconveniences or grievances. We must instead possess a war mentality. The good news is that hell would not be in such a frenzy if heaven were not advancing. God is working to bring revival and spiritual awakening to our nations. Guys, for as long as I can remember as a church, as a young man, as a young pastor, as a, as a young teen even, the church around the world has been praying for awakening. 
the church around the world, almost in every service, we have prayed for great revival. And I believe that God is giving that to us through this hungering and thirsting. But I need you to understand something, that as we study the awakening of God's people throughout Scripture, God's move, the, mo the great moves of God were always preceded by or precipitated by a great crisis. David had his Goliath. Jeph Jehoshaphat had his Ammonites. Esther, she had her Haman. Daniel had his lion, and Jonah had his whale. And the early church had Paul, or, or better known as Saul, before he became a Christian. In Acts chapter 8, it says this, Now Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen, when Stephen was stoned. And, and it said, And a great persecution broke out and arose against the church, and, and, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Now some scholars say that the church had gotten real comfortable in Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? The early church so soon after Jesus has, has gotten comfortable, has gotten relaxed in Jerusalem, and they were not fulfilling God's mandate to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And this persecution broke out by Saul. Now Saul thought he was coming to destroy the church. He didn't know that he was the instrument of God for revival. Saul sought to crush the church and to destroy the church by crushing it just like a child would crush a dandelion. You know what happens, though, when you destroy a dandelion, right? Those seeds go everywhere. And those seeds that you sought to destroy, they are spread out everywhere, and suddenly you got dandelions everywhere. That's what happened to the church. He sought to destroy it, and to escape persecution, they dispersed, and they carried one very important thing with them, the message of hope, the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world here today. I need you to hear that this morning because we may not have our Paul, but we have our coronavirus. <laughs> I hate to keep bringing that up, but it is the reality of where we're at this morning. We have that. Just make sure it doesn't have us. We have this coronavirus, and in spite of everything that is, we see in our news and we see around us, it's an opportunity for a great awakening. Because outside the church walls now is where we find ourselves, right? And we're finding that the church can, be, can indeed be the church without the walls of the building that we have come to identify as the church. So I dare you to be the church. Just, just be the church. In our passage this morning, in John chapter 4, verses 5 through 24, again, I'm not reading the whole passage, but you really can't get the whole context of what's going on unless you take and understand what has gone before. So I implore you to spend some time reading this and, and letting it permeate and through, uh, throughout your understanding here this morning. But in this passage, we see that the Apostle John is describing an encounter that Jesus had with an unnamed Samaritan woman at a well on a dry, dusty road that ran between Jerusalem and Galilee. Jesus wasn't just wandering between Jerusalem and Galilee. He had a purpose in his, in his moving. And in the middle of his moving, he had, an, he had a purpose of encountering this lady, this unnamed lady, at the, uh, the, the, the Samaritan woman at the well. And it was during that encounter, if you take the time to read that entire passage this morning, that Jesus illuminated, that Jesus revealed to her exactly who she was. Exactly who she was. He, she says, she says, I've met someone who has told me all that there is to know about myself. That's a very loose paraphrase, but he, he, he knew who she was. He knew where she had been, and he knew where she was right then, and he revealed that to her. But also, not only did he reveal to her who she was, because that's not enough. I don't need someone to just take and reveal to me who I am. I need hope in the midst of it. And in the midst of that conversation, in the midst of that encounter, Jesus illuminated to her exactly who he was. He says, I, he talked about, I am a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Springing up to everlasting life. And that's who Christ is. An unceasing well of water refreshing the spirit, reviving the soul that springs up 
to everlasting life, and it never ceases here this morning. And in response to Jesus' words, this unnamed Samaritan woman asks a question or, or makes a statement. She says, Sir, I, per, I, per, I perceive that you are a prophet. See, she has understood who Christ is. She may not have had a full understanding at this point, but she knew that before her stood a prophet of God. And then she makes this statement. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in, that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when, when, you, will neither, uh, when, it's coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. She, he said, you worship, in verse 22, he says, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But notice in verse 23, he says this. But the hour is coming, and now is the time when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, what she seemed to be asking was this. I've come to believe you are who you said you are. Okay, because you can see that epiphany that she has in this whole story. And she understands now that she is standing before someone who, if not the Messiah, he is the mouthpiece of God proclaiming the Messiah. But I believe she understood that he was the Messiah. And when she said, when she said that, when she spoke those words, it seems what she is saying now is, what am I going to do about a place to worship? Where, where am I going to go? You know, what am I going to do now? Does that not sound kind of familiar? It could have been spoken today. What am I going to do about a place to worship? What about the temple? What about this temple? What about the church? Where am I going? And Jesus replies to her, as we've read, he says, the hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is doing what? Is seeking us, is seeking, to, seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So what does it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? Jesus is, Jesus is giving a direct, now as we look at that, we need to remember that God, Jesus is giving a direct response to her request for a ge geographical location for her to go and worship and a chronological time. That's what he's responding to. So what does it mean to, to worship him in spirit and truth then? William Barclay is someone I, I really enjoy reading quite a bit. And he makes this statement about this passage. I actually discovered this years ago, and it came back to me this week. But he makes this statement about this passage. He says this. He says, true worship is when man, through his spirit, attains to friendship and intimacy with God. Genuine worship does not consist in coming to a certain place, nor in, go, nor in going through a certain ritual or litur liturgy, nor even in bringing certain gifts. True worship is when the spirit, the immortal, invisible part of man, speaks to and meets with God himself, the immortal and the invisible. I need you to understand, this morning as we come to worship, let's dare to worship him in spirit and truth. It's not about a place. It's not about a geographical location or time. It is about worshiping him in spirit and truth, right where we are, right where we are right this moment. There's never a time as a believer when we cease to worship God and, wor and serve him. There's never a time that we cease to worship and serve God. It's not reserved for a specific time or place. It's not confined to a geographical location or a chronological designation. It is a call and a promise that we can be the church. So church, be the church. Today in the midst of a, a pandemic, and most of us had really never paid much attention to that word unless we just ran across it in the dictionary, but everybody knows what it means now. That's a worldwide epidemic that affects every country throughout the world to one degree or another. But today in the midst of a, past, uh, of a pandemic, God has issued a clarion call to simply be the church. Wherever you find yourself, 
be the church. Wherever you find yourself today and in the days to come, be the church. Worship him in spirit and in truth. You say, okay, Pastor Brady, how, you do, how do you do this? Well, you do this by simply being steady and being ready in the place of prayer. Being ready in the place of prayer. Last week, I, I, I referenced uh, a, a king, a young king by the name of Jehoshaphat, who was faced with a quickly escalating crisis. And in that crisis, it said at first he began to fear, and then he called the people to prayer, and he went himself to prayer. Crisis compelled him to God in prayer. When crisis compels the world to panic, let, God, let crisis compel God's people to the place of prayer. See, our world's panicking. Our world's hysterical. hysterical. Our world is fearful. Our world may get brutal. We never can tell. In the midst of it, we don't need more of the same. Let crisis compel you to God. Crisis compel you to prayer. My favorite part of that whole passage this morning in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is that last little bit when Jehoshaphat prays. And he makes this statement, and as a pastor, you've heard me say it a lot of times. He says, we have no power to face this vast army. Can I get an amen about that? That is absolutely true. We, we cover up in our homes and we put all sorts of safeguards, but still it seems to be sweeping across the world and across the nation here today. We have no power against this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's a, that's a prayer of trust. It's a prayer of reliance and surrender in difficult circumstances, and he blazes the path for us also today to just compel us to the place of prayer. Now, another prayer I read this week I think is good. I just, it was a, a, a woman, women of the word, and they, they wrote these words. It says, let your light expose the cause of my hardships and give me the wisdom to know what to do. Give me a persevering heart so that I will wait with patience as you work in my circumstances. Help me keep my mind focused on the glory that you will reveal when these trials are over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's a good word to grab hold of here this morning. So, so be ready and steady. Be steady and ready in the place of prayer. Dare to be the church. Number two, be grace on purpose. Be grace on purpose wherever you find yourself today. Full of grace and truth, just like Jesus. And trust me, it will not be business as usual. Because you will stand out in the midst of a hysterical, crazy world that is truly becoming untethered from its moorings. Jesus said these words. He says, guys, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is hit, a city is set on a hill. That a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. And then he says this: Let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. It's time for the lamps to be trimmed. To be set on a table in a very public setting for all to see. It, it will stand out. It will stand out in places and ways you may surprise you. Like many of you, I was out about, out about yesterday and early in the morning, about 8 o'clock, I was in Kroger simply going to buy a few donuts. I wasn't going to stock up on groceries. I just wanted a few donuts. That's all, that's all I wanted. And, the play, and as I walked in, it, it surprised me that at 8 o'clock in the morning, the place was packed. There were people everywhere. There were long lines snaking down the aisles, and, and you could kind of feel a disgruntledness around you. It wasn't open yet, as far as it wasn't an open disgruntledness, but you could kind of sense the unsettledness of, of what was going on around us at, that morning. As I was sitting there in that long line, I, you know, kind of like the rest of us sit in long lines, I, I tend to get a little impatient. I had to kind of keep that down a little bit. 
And then there was this lady, the, a worker, that walked over to open up a series of new lines in the self-checkout. And she walked over there. And so she said, come on over here and we'll, we'll begin to set you up. So she walked over there and we all took our places at the different cashiers, cash registers. And then she stopped what she was doing and she walked back down to the other end of the, of the cash registers a, a few a while down. And we were standing there waiting and standing there looking. Well, I kind of thought it was funny. I just kind of enjoying the moment, you know, and just not thinking too much about it. And then she came back up, and she fired everything up, and then she went around to every cash register and turned them all on. And, and she got to me, and she says, look at you smiling like you are. She says, everybody else is around here, and they're, they're, disgrunt, they're just all unhappy, but look at you smiling. And I didn't get real biblical, but I just say, you know what? There's no point in being upset. I appreciate the work you're doing, and I want to thank you for what you're doing. And as I walked out after I finished, I just patted her on the shoulder and again, and I said, I said, thank you for all that you're doing. It was a simple thing. It didn't cost me a penny. However, it was a simply an opportunity to be grace in difficult days. Don't miss it. Be the church. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Make somebody's day a little bit better. Just be grace. Just be the church wherever you find yourself in the days to come. Bring calm to somebody else and you'll be calm. You bring peace to someone else and God himself will speak peace into your heart. Encourage somebody else and when you see them encouraged, you know what it will do to you? It will lift your head too. Be grace. On purpose, be grace wherever you find yourself full of grace, just like Jesus. And then the next thing, be moved on purpose by impulses of righteousness. By impulses of righteousness. God the Holy Spirit is moving in and through us, and he will be recognized as moving in and through us by what I have come to understand as impulses of righteousness. Romans 8, 14 says these words. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If God is leading you, then when you sense or discern something to be true or feel moved in your spirit to do something, analyze it, but don't analyze it to death. Don't analyze it into oblivion. Perhaps God is speaking to you through his Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, I guarantee that God is speaking to you through his Holy Spirit for a particular reason or situation. Act on those impulses of righteousness. Just, just simply be the church. I, I got an opportunity, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm, not, I, I'm not always like this, but this week God has spoken to me and talked to me and, and used me in some ways, and I really appreciate that. But I was in Walmart the other day, and I was running around, like I had my hair on fire. <laughs> I just had, I had to get this, 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 and this. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking for an encounter. But in the midst of it all, I discovered it. I was kind of uh, uh, uptight a little bit. And I, and I went straight, st stepping up to the uh, photo counter there in Walmart. And there was this man ahead of me. And he, was, he had the guy behind the counter busy for just a little bit. And you know what we normally do? We say, would you please hurry up? I got, I got important things to do. But instead, I, I, I've just sensed the presence of the Spirit at that moment, and, uh, and, I, and I began to pay attention to what was going on. The man had a picture that he was getting copied, and he was picking it up that day, and it was a picture of a beautiful woman. <laughs> and he said, this, this is my wife. Well, this guy was 70 years old, 70, 75 years old or, or something like that. He said, this is my wife. He said, we've been married 49 years. And she's dying of dementia. And I wanted to get this picture to remind me and to remind others that the woman you see dying is not the woman that I see. This is my wife. And he said these words, he says it goes by so quickly, doesn't it? And I just was standing beside him. I said, oh, I know. And we began to have the talk about how somebody blinked and 
suddenly 40 years has gone by. And we talked a little bit, and, and, I, and, I, and I felt a check in my spirit that said, you need to pray for him. Well, you don't do that in Walmart. People are all around, and you got the, you got the people behind the counter, and you know they think you're crazy, one more crazy in Walmart. So I said, Lord, Lord I'm not going to do it. And, and he began to put the uh, picture back in his envelope, and, 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 just, and I asked him about church, what church he went to, and he told me the church. Yeah, I got his name. I'm not going to share it here, but I got his name, and, and he, he got ready to turn to walk off, and I said, I, I need you to just stop. I'm, I'm going to ask you if I can do something. It's going to be kind of strange. He says, what? I said, can I pray for you? He said, yes, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I got the opportunity to pray for him in Walmart. And one thing that I prayed, I said, Father, give this dear woman, Barbara, moments of, he says she's combative he says i said in the days to come give her moments of lucidity that she may be calm and know everyone around her amen and he says you know that's just what i want god to do and god has done it those moments when she is just wide awake and we know who she is and she knows who we are guys Act on impulses of righteousness, even if they're bizarre, even if they seem strange. There's a story in the book of Acts that God is talking to Philip, the evangelist. I don't know what Philip was doing. Maybe he was eating his dinner. I, ha I have no idea. But, but God told him, he said, dude, get up from where you're at. And I want you to go down to this place. He didn't tell him why he was going. He said, I want you to go. And, he said, and Philip said, all right, God, an impulse of righteousness. And when he got there, he found this Ethiopian nobleman, an Ethiopian unit, who was reading from Isaiah. And as he, as he heard him reading from Isaiah, Philip began to talk to the man. He said, do you know what you're reading? And the man said, no. Could somebody explain it to me? He said, Philip said, I can. And he got the opportunity to share the gospel with that Ethiopian eunuch that day. And, uh, and the man, as, as he finished sharing with him, he said, the, the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, nothing. Let's get it done. And he baptized him right there. You said, Pastor Brady, what did that mean? You know what? That eunuch from Ethiopia was going home. And through him, a, a Christian community was established in Ethiopia that exists to this very day. Impulse of righteousness that changes the world. You know, you don't know all that's going on in a person's life. You may think you do as you see them, but you don't. You don't know what's going on. But God does. And God makes known his mind to us through his spirit, speaking into your spirit. So listen to it. Act upon it. Be the church. You never know here this morning how close someone is to the edge. Especially in these fearful, uncertain times when they're told to lock themselves away in their homes to be safe. You may be handling it quite well. You may be enjoying it. Most folks aren't. But when that comes to mind and that name comes to mind, act upon that impulse of righteousness because you might be that last link they have to life and the gospel here this morning. You might be that last message or the, that critical message of importance that they and hope that they need to hear people are lonely i i I'm, i was surprised kind of by that as my wife spoke about someone said this week that they were really lonely well i'm not lonely right now i've got my wife and kids around me i'm harassed <laughs> there's lots going on around us but i'm not lonely so i assume that everybody else is not lonely guys people are lonely and they're isolated which exacerbates the loneliness and a friendly voice or a kind word can mean more today than ever before. When that name comes to mind, act on that impulse of righteousness. You may not know what goes on, but God does. And God is speaking through his spirit to your spirit. Act on it here this morning. You know what? There are also those that are ready to hear the message of hope that the name of Jesus Christ brings today. More ready today than they've ever been before. When that name comes to mind, God knows. And here spirit is speaking to your spirit to make a difference. Act on those impulses of righteousness. A simple phone call. 
a, a note that, some, that you write. You may not be technologically adept, but you can take up a pen and drop a note to somebody. A text, text somebody, or better yet, we have this remarkable thing that we can do today with technology, with our cell phones even. My grandkids do it to me. My phone will ring and I'll, and I'll hit that button and suddenly there's lovely faces on that phone. And my grandkids who are hours and hours away, I'm able to talk to them. I can see their faces. I love to hear their voices. But seeing a face makes all the difference in the world. Little things. Little things make a difference. Matter of fact, little things that, that don't seem to amount to much can make all the difference in the world. By the way, remember, how many drops of rain does it take to break a dam? One. The last one. And you might be that last one. You might be the very one that God will and can use to this day to change the world. You see, you change the world when you're a part of changing the world for one single solitary person. Be the church. Be steady. Be steady in prayer. Be grace. Be moved to action. Be the church. I know some folks are probably multi -folk, multitudes of people. I'm one of them are distressed and upset because we find ourselves having to cancel our gatherings or close the church, as some would say, to regular gatherings. As I said, I, I, I am. I miss the social interaction of my Benton First Church of the Nazarene family. However, the other day, as I was wrestling with these feelings, and I was wrestling with them, trying to come to grips with them, I came across a post from an old friend and professor of mine that, that was my professor while I attended Wesley College in Florence, Mississippi. His name is Dr. Chris Lorstorfer. And in his post, he wrote these words. We haven't closed the church. The church is not a building. It's a body. And throughout history, when, the, when disaster strikes, the church steps up. This is not about our practice of physically meeting together. Even though that is important, and I look forward to the day when we can do it again. But he says, I am reminded that John Wesley said that when you have the choice between works of piety, your own devotional life, and works of mercy, that is, reaching out to help those around you, you should sacrifice the works of piety for the works of mercy. And that is what we have done. We are still the body of Christ, even, though, even if we have to gather on Facebook, Facebook Live. We are still the hands and feet of Jesus. Even if we have to pray together at a distance. I don't think this brief time of being creatively integrated will hurt us one bit. In fact, I expect revival from it. I expect God to use it. Lord knows the church needs to rebrand itself. And this is an opportunity for all of our neighbors to see what we are really made of. Let's show them Jesus. Let's be the church. Phil Kage years ago wrote a song that says, Rise up, O man of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God. His kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and in the night of wrong. Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait. Send forth, the, send forth to serve the needs of men. In Christ our strength is, is great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet is tro have trod. You, as brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O men of God. You cannot close the church. So be the church. Be Jesus. The Messiah. He who, who, he who this world has been looking for all their lives. He became sin who knew no sin that we might be God.
the Lord, oh my soul, let everything that ever has, has breath, praise the Lord. Just be the church. You cannot close the doors. You cannot close the church. Be the church here today. Let me pray for you. Lord, take care of our folks. In darkness, bring light. In chaos, bring comfort. In uncertainty, bring peace. And Lord, may, not, may you not only bring it to us, but may you disperse it through us to a lost and dying world. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Thank you for joining us. And God bless you. Until the next time. Amen. <laughs>